This is the web transcription service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute, welcoming you to the final speakers event of the spring 2013 season, held on June 20th. We were honoured to host Mr. Roger Lucy, Political First Secretary of the Canadian Embassy in Tehran during the hostage crisis of 1980 and one of the last four officers to leave the embassy after the successful departure of the American house guests. Following dinner, Roger engages in a conversation with Eric Morse and is introduced by RCMI member Jim Lutz. Thank you, Ed. Thank you very much. The, um, the simple facts of my life he was born in Britain, raised in Virginia and Winnipeg, MA in history from the University of Waterloo, joined uh, the Department of External Affairs in 1971, and a 33-year uh, uh, career with him, postings in Chicago, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Iran, Norway, turned down Tobago. I'm not sure Chicago is the most dangerous of them. <laughs> uh, well, tonight we're here because I want to hear about the dramatic facts of what happened when he was posted to Tehran as first secretary to Ambassador Ken Taylor. This is as the uh, Iranian Revolution unfolded. And Roger Immerse is rather, uh, I can think about it, a John Buck novel, uh, using uh, his talents, his lesbian and linguistic talents, to help the American house guests, as they were called. Uh, to help uh, get them out of the country, to help get Canadians out of the country that was falling apart. Um, Roger, I am convinced that if you were in Khartoum in 1885, General Gordon would have been gotten back to Britain and not died a martyr. You were a resourceful fellow. After that, Roger, of course, continued in Ottawa doing intelligence analysis and uh, counterterrorism for foreign affairs. Uh, he received the Order of Canada uh, for his contribution and retired in 2004. But he's been busy since then. Uh, he's written 10 books uh, on the subject of Canadian military equipment. Um, things like the Skink and an aircraft tank, the Skycamp armored car, the Otter wrecking car, and if you've heard of any of those, uh, that's pretty impressive, you must be in the armored Corps. Uh, these were written, I want to put in an ad here, these were written for a company called Service Publications, and if you go to the website, servicepub.com, you can see and uh, get Roger's book. There's one I mentioned that's particularly interesting, probably a few of you know this, in World War II, there was a, an armored train on the Canadian-Alaska border maintained by the Canadian Army just in case the Japanese came this way. It's a fascinating story, whether you care about trains or not. Roger wrote a book on it. So have a look at uh, service publications. Um, sadly, Roger has a disease. Uh, he is a collector. He has an immense uh, collection of militaria, which I think would make our museum committee agree with envy. Uh, unfortunately, uh, as Ed mentioned, his wife Susan, who is herself a career foreign service officer, uh, is able to try and keep some kind of control over you. So, this evening, what we're here to do first is we're going to have a conversation, or what we might call an interrogation, our own area wars, and Roger are going to come up here and uh, have a conversation after which. Uh, we will open to uh, questions from the audience. So, Eric and Roger, if you would like to come up, and the spotlight is on you. Thank you. One of the things that we're not going to talk about during this little interrogation is the film. Um, that's for later, and that's for you guys. But um, you've got a timeline on the back of your programs that tells you the, the, the basic skeleton of events between 1978 and 1980 when the whole scenario developed. And what I'm going to do is just sort of quietly guide a Roger, which is sort of like guiding a howitzer shell, uh, through the events. So, you started out 
in early 1978 on a temporary posting into Baghdad in Iraq. But you knew that uh, that was a temporary, and you knew that you were going to be going into Tehran at some point in the middle of 1978, and you got there in August. Did you have any real idea of what was in wait for you? I had no idea because at the time, at the time when uh, I accepted the posting to Tehran, which is in early 1978, uh, all the best wisdom was that the Iranian regime was wonderfully stable and would certainly live as long as the Shah lived. Of course, nobody realized the Shah was uh, already sick with cancer and uh, that was be shortening his regime. But there were a few sort of eruptions happening in Iran uh, early in, late in 77, early in 78. Uh, people were becoming bolder and bolder about demonstrating against him. In the past, that largely been something done by students safely outside of Iran, but they were starting to have, um, have uh, demonstrations inside Iran. These were often met with armed force, people died. Then the way it worked in the Iranian Shia sect of Islam, 40 days after people were, died, you would have a demonstration to commemorate their martyrdom. So there'd be more demonstrations, more people would die, and this started to build up. Uh, and by the time I got there, it was beginning to get fairly regular. Uh, so, so bad that within a week of my getting there, and it wasn't due to my getting there, uh, the Shah declared martial law. Uh, there was a ban on more than three people assembling, and there was a nighttime a curfew at, starting at nine o'clock, which basically ended my social life for the rest of the imperial <laughs> regime. Um, and that was immediately met by uh, a large demonstration who tested the tested the, the, the assembly ban, and they were shot down in large numbers at Jale Square by the army, so you could expect that there would be the follow-on demonstrations. Uh, things started to pick up in October. We, uh, the, there were, there were um, uh, strikes that were called. Uh, it was becoming clearer and clearer that there was a great deal of organization going on behind the orchestration of the strikes and demonstrations. And, uh, the organization became even more pronounced after the Shah rather foolishly uh, persuaded uh, Saddam Hussein to send Ayatollah Khomeini, who had been in exile in, in Najaf, Iraq, and he sent, expelled him from, from Iraq, and he ended up in Paris. Suddenly, he's in the middle of the world's press. Uh, he, has a, he, he can uh, say what he likes. His, Remarks are broadcast, they're picked up in Iran, and the pace of things gets even more hectic. Come early November, uh, it gets really exciting. There is a pretty close to an organized uprising in Tehran and the major cities of I Iran. There's uh, targeted burnings of government offices, liquor stores, car dealerships, anything that's sort of associated with the regime, associated with a uh, decadent Western way of life. And uh, the Shah then sacks his civilian government, puts in a military government. Needless to say, the, there is a more vigorous um, response to the demonstrations. And you get a situation where every night, just before curfew, the lights go out all over Tehran. The mobs come out, they start shouting, Marg Bar Shah, Death the Shah, Rahbaman Khomeini, our leader is Khomeini. And, uh, and, and, and um, then the army comes out, there's shooting, and uh, all in all, quite, quite exciting. So, by mid-November, when this was picking up speed, uh, you began thinking, you, all of you in the, uh, in the diplomatic community began thinking about getting your nationals out of Iran. And in those days there was a very big Canadian community in Iran. And I gather that one of your responsibilities was to explore ways of getting them out because getting people out of Iran 
in a hurry wasn't that easy. Yes, we, by, by November, December, it was clear that the situation was deteriorating. There was concern that with the strikes and everything, air travel in and out of Iran was going to become more difficult. Uh, the petrol industry had been very severely impacted by the strikes. Um, it was almost impossible to find fuel for your car. There were massive lineups outside every petrol station, outside of places selling cooking gas. Uh, we were all concerned that it would soon be time to have to get the international community out. Canada had about 1,300 nationals in Iran. A large number of them were concentrated in a forestry project up in the western coast of the Caspian Sea, um, north of the mountains that lie beyond Tehran. And this, the, these people um, were, were, uh, were concerned about where things were going. Uh, we organized a system, uh, oh, we, the international, the, the Western embassies essentially divide the country up into districts and each, each country became responsible for all foreign nationals in a particular area. So we got the West Caspian, the Germans had the East Caspian, the British had the Gulf Coast, the Americans the area around Isfahan, and we all looked after our own people in Tehran. So to coordinate things with, uh, with the Canadians in, in the Caspian and also to look at various ways in which where can we get our planes in uh, because it's a long journey over the mountains to Tehran. Uh, is it possible to fly a plane into say, there's a major town up there called Rasht. Uh, is it possible to take them by sea across the Caspian even into the Soviet Union or by road into the Soviet Union. So I, I scouted out these routes, uh, went with an embassy driver in, in, in December and, and puttered around the Caspian coast, uh, liaised with the Canadians there. They were putting in place uh, plans for buses and such like. Uh, and uh, this, this we worked into our contingency planning. If you want to carry on. Yeah. Um, so while this was happening and you were, Iran was revving up for a revolution and you were working on getting people out to safety, the, the ironic thing of course is that uh, a couple of months later the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan. No, that was, a, been, that was, oh sorry, that was 79, wasn't it? That's right. The, but, at this time, there the revolution, the, the uprising, first revolution in Afghanistan was in, I think, April or May of 1978. So that was not yet a problem. Right, but... Um, so a, a route, we actually talked to the Soviets, and uh, they did say if worst came to worst, they would facilitate the exit of our nationals into, into their, to Baku. But we never had to use that. Right. Um, so we moved into December... And um, at the moment that the militants came over the wall the, of the U.S., I beg your pardon? You're getting ahead of you. We haven't had the revolution yet. We have. Oh, I'm sorry. That's right. I've skipped a year. Yes, time flies um, when you're having fun. Right. So you, that's right, you ended up spending the year... Uh, most of the year of 1979, dealing with increasing numbers of media. Well, I'll, I'll, uh, essentially, December 1978, uh, things come pretty close to a crescendo. It, it coincides with a Shiite holy month called Moharam, uh, and there's a day there called Ashura, where their Imam uh, uh, Hussein was killed by the Umayyads at the Battle of Karbala in six. 70 something, I suddenly forget the, the date, but it is momentous. They all come out in the tens of thousands and beat themselves with chains. And something like two million people went to this big monument on the road to the airport, and the army just stood aside. And I think that's the point where everyone thought, this is it, the regime's over. Uh, in early January, essentially, it looked like soon it'd be impossible to fly civilian planes in and out. Uh, we, we arranged for DND to start flying. We got clearances from the 
Iranian Air Force, which was interesting because they, needless to say, were not very keen to admit that things had got this bad, that evac nationals should be evacuated. But we did get permission. Uh, our first, the first we only had permission to bring planes into Tehran. So I had to go up to the Caspian coast again uh, with a couple of colleagues. Um, one of them is John Broadbent, and there's a chap from the German embassy. And they stayed up there to organize the, the people at, in, in the forestry uh, workings. And I took the first three busloads south to Tehran, over, over the Elbers Mountains, through the rather battered town of Gazin, and um, to Tehran Airport. And that's when our first Hercules took them out. After that, we got permission to take them out through Rash, and then the planes are flying directly to Rash. But in all, by the end of um, February 1979, we had taken out about 1,500 Canadians and other foreign nationals. And then the rep. Oh, sorry. And then, I was going to say, and then you, there, there was this sort of hiatus between the wave of evacuations and the uh, actual crisis while the revolution unfolded. What were you up to at that point in those months? Well, it had been very, shall we say, exciting up until February 1979. The revolution uh, climaxed uh, between the 11th and 14th of February when... Uh, the Iranian army essentially collapsed. Khomeini had already come back two weeks earlier, uh, had essentially set up a de facto government. The, the army collapsed in three very exciting days in, in February. Um, and then it sort of settled down into a rather strange calm. I mean, it wasn't very pleasant. There were, they were every, every day they were taking members of the old regime out and giving them quick trials and shooting them. There were revolutionary committees springing up that were sort of uh, dealing out sort of impromptu justice. Uh, but slowly things started to get back to normal. They had a referendum which led to the declaration that Iran was no longer an empire but was an Islamic republic. It, it bore every relation, it bore no relationship to a Canadian election except for the fact that the bars were closed. <laughs> <laughs> um, but by the summer of 1979, it was, it was really actually quite um, uneventful. Uh, we started to take advantage of the calm to uh, explore the country. I, I went down to, with a colleague, to, to Isfahan and Shiraz, uh, passing through the holy city of Gom. We did more leisurely uh, exploration of the Caspian area. I went with an Australian colleague to down to the oil region to uh, Abaddon and Karg Island, which is really interesting. Um, some of my, my British colleagues went out to Kurdish, the Kurdish areas. My New Zealand colleagues went out to the Turkmen area. So we got a very able to assemble a picture of how Iran was adjusting to life after the revolution. There was a lot of unrest in the periphery. Uh, various ethnic groups who never liked being part of the Persian Empire were, were in various stages of semi-unrest. Um, but things seemed fairly normal. And then we get the situation in October where the Shah, who we hadn't realized he was sick, is admitted uh, to the USA for cancer treatment. And suddenly it's, what's going to happen next? Um, at that point, at that point, Roger decides to take a two-week rest and relaxation break in Western Europe. And in the meantime, the militants come over the wall. Now that I've caught up with myself, the militants come over the wall at the U.S. Embassy. And by all security protocols, Roger should not have known anything about that until the moment he touched dirt in Tehran again, because I remember I was serving in External Affairs Headquarters in Ottawa at the time, and when this all broke some months later and the whole crisis was resolved, 
I was completely flabbergasted that the Department of External Affairs cafeteria could actually keep a secret. But somehow or other, Roger found out before he got back to Tehran. Well, we all know about November 4th, and we've all seen that on Argo, and that is pretty accurate on Argo, in fact. I think. From my American friends who were there, they say it's a pretty close... Uh, reenactment of how the takeover of the American embassy happened. What they truncate very, very briefly is the five or the six Americans who were not taken prisoner and who about a week later ended up in the care of uh, the Canadian embassy. They just sort of miraculously show up there. In fact, they spent a very anxious week on the run and, um, and, and ended up four of them with our immigration officer, John Sheardown, and two of them with our ambassador, Ken Taylor. This, of course, was not something that one wanted to be known in the streets of Tehran, but it was, of course, conveyed to Ottawa. I was visiting a friend of mine in Brussels. He comes home from the office and says, look at this, you've got guests at your embassy. And I say, and he hands me this blue, uh, piece of paper, which is called Popsum. Popsum is a summary of all the more interesting telegrams that have come in over the day, over the, in the course over of the, the night. 24 hour period. Yeah. And teams of oppressed young junior officers get up at the, at the crack of dawn to make summaries of these, and they are sent out to every division in, extern in what was then external affairs, to senior managers throughout the Canadian government, to every Canadian embassy abroad. So I don't know how many people see these things, probably about four or 5,000 every day. It's, it no longer exists, but it was, it was a key part of our sort of morning routine to read this, to see what was happening in the world. So my friend Jeff brings this thing back to his staff quarter, and I read this, and I go, ooh, how very interesting. My next reaction is, I think I'd better get back to Tehran. Um, I, the, what I was terrified of is, in fact, that somebody in Ottawa would remember I wasn't there and tell me not to come back. So <laughs> I rather foolishly went back to Tehran. Do you want to carry on, or shall I? Yeah, no, I'll carry on here. I mean, <laughs> one of the things that totally blows my mind about this incident is that... Uh, Somebody thought that this was innocuous enough to put in the 24-hour dispatch summary, and every one of us read it. And how it stayed secret, I have no idea, because 4,000 people were out there reading it. There was uh, no Twitter. There was no Twitter, exactly. Um, so you, you had a few qualms about returning to post, but now you're back in Tehran. You've now got a secret. Uh, and you had to help keep the secret, and that wasn't all that easy because things started, people started connecting dots pretty quickly, didn't they? Yeah, the, the one thing about Iran is, in those days, was uh, after the hostage crisis, it became the media focus of the world. I mean, every big name in the world's <laughs> press was staked out in Tehran. And a lot of our time was actually spent when we're not telling Ottawa what was going on uh, and going about our other daily jobs of looking after Canadians and uh, looking after our house guests was looking after the world press. They didn't have a U.S. embassy to go to, to to get the briefings. None of them would be in Tehran since the revolution. So they all come trooping to our door and they want to know well, what's happened in the last nine months? So we tell them what's happened in the last nine months. And then, of course, they start saying, have they got all the, are all the Americans there? Are we here? There's some that are loose. We say, no, I've uh, never heard anything like that. And, um, but it was, there was a lot of media out there, and uh, looking after them took a fair amount of our, our time and attention. But it was the guy in Washington, Peltier, who yeah. uh, first put the dots together and uh, asked Ottawa, wasn't it? Yeah, there's, uh, there's a chap called, uh, oh, what's his, uh, Michel Pelche. He was actually the son of an ambassador. Uh, he was working for La Presse. And 
he diligently sort of counted up all the names of the of the Americans who'd been at the embassy and the names of all the ones who'd been released because they were female or uh, colored or somehow you know thought not to be part of the oppressive American regime. And he realized that there were some names left over. And he thought, if I was an American, where would I go? And so he went to the Canadian embassy, like they would, and he started asking questions. And eventually, one of my colleagues said, well, I cannot tell a lie, but I would like you very much not to tell anyone else until everyone's safely out. And he, I, I can't imagine the journalist doing this today, but I'm sure some would, but uh, said, okay, but just make sure when they are out, I get the story. Actually, it has happened. We had hostage issues in Afghanistan. <coughs> M- Melissa Fung That's, was one of yeah. the uh, obvious ones, or one of the more um, prominent ones. And... Uh, the embassy in Afghanistan did ask the Canadian media to sit on it, and they did sit on it until she was released. Bob Fowler was not so lucky. Uh, he was front and center in the media from the moment he was taken in uh, in Sahel. But um, so uh, you're you now know you're sitting on a on a powder keg. Um, how long did it take you to start working up exfiltration schemes with the Americans? And um, did you have a plan B in case the Revolutionary Guard came knocking at the door? Uh, yes, we did have a plan B. And uh, this, is, this is where international cooperation works very well. Uh, we rented a safe house, but we didn't want us, you know, our names to be on it. So my... Ken Taylor's good friend, the New Zealand ambassador, Chris Beebe, went and rented a vacant house near where our house guests were being kept. And he had it furnished with New Zealand furniture. And then we parked a couple of our military secure, uh, military police uh, guards in there just to keep it warm. And the, the, our house guests were coached in sort of, there was a back door that they could have got out of quickly, and they did a little evacuation drills. Um, and so we were ready to hopefully get them to safe haven should anything break. Fortunately, nothing did break. In the meantime, and I don't, re- I really can't go into the timing of all this because I really, obviously, I was in Tehran, I wasn't in Ottawa. I'm not quite sure quite how early, but let's say around mid-December talks were seriously beginning between our intelligence people and the American intelligence people about how to get them out. In fact, our people, I'm told by a friend of mine who was there, had actually begun to work on the sort of forging Canadian identities for these people, building up cover stories, uh, preparing... um, uh, the get, getting in getting in the works the preparation of the passports and all that. So the planning at the Canadian side was far advanced, but there was cons- we did want American buy-in. Uh, it took a fair amount of lobbying by Flora McDonald, our our then foreign minister, to get her colleague Cyrus Vance to focus on the problem. The American problem, of course, was the 52 that were in their embassy of and plus three who were in the Iranian foreign ministry where they'd been stranded in the reception floor for, for since November 4th, and there they stayed for the next year. Um, and um, she finally, because of the danger leaks, got their minds focused on it, and that's where our friend Tony Mendes comes into the picture. And uh, I think... You know, if you watch Argo, that sort of stuff, a little jazzed up, but the, the, how he, what he was doing in, in Washington is, and in Hollywood is, is, is probably fairly well portrayed. I mean, I don't know Hollywood, but they certainly have a very... Uh, they use the CIA headquarters, and it looks very well. well. Um, but so we're basically going back and forth with Ottawa, talking about scenarios, what sort of cover story. Should we you know, get them out 
t- send them south, get them on a ship? Should we take them over the Turkish border? Uh, there, there were various ways of smuggling people there. Uh, should we go through the airport? And we sort of went back and forth over all these things. And, and eventually we came to the conclusion that probably the safest bit and way was actually through the airport if these people have a good cover story. Um, so we're talking about cover stories going back and forth with uh, all, you know, all the, the sort of scenarios ahead, like teachers and uh, agronomists and oil workers, and these these were all seriously discussed as to what was working. And there was this one one that Ottawa suddenly said, no, "The Americans are suggesting they could be a film crew." We said, "What? <laughs> let, let, let's let, let's stick with agronomists, guys. It sounds a lot more more sensible." But um, Anyway, there was a, a, an ongoing dialogue through fr- from late December through January as, as to um, as to what would be the best way. And the way I understand it from you is that one of the reasons they settled on the science fiction film was not so much for the Iranians' benefit as it would be something that the uh, escapees would be comfortable with. Um, yeah. What. Essentially, when so the when Tony Mendez, he, he and his still unknown colleague Julio um, came came uh, appeared on our doorstep on the twenty sixth of, of January. We knew they were coming, of course, and uh, Tony had this wonderful, wonderful. Uh, I don't call it a storyboard. Um, it was it was all the all the work and research they'd done on the Argo thing, and suddenly you think, ooh, this looks pretty good. And we said, okay, well, we'll take let's all go over to where where our house guests are, and we'll run the various plans past them. And uh, that's the one they like. And we kind of liked it too. And it's funny. I, I think we all got into the play acting of it. It it, it really. Do you think there was a certain yeah. amount of stress relief involved in this? Because you've been under stress for about three. I'm months. sure there was. I'm yeah. sure there really was. I think uh, you know this is this is something we can go with. Yeah. And uh, we really want to get this done. And before anything goes wrong, and the sooner the better. And. So about this car chase. Car chase? Car chase. On the way to the airport, you know. No. No? <laughs> what about those visas? <clears throat> visas are fine, except uh, when I looked at them, this was before Tony showed up, I thought, this is funny, the date is all in the, in the, in, 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 in uh, the, the, we talk about Arabic numerals, but the numerals used in Iran and in the Arab world actually are the real Arab numerals, which are not like our Arabic numerals. But anyway, it was in it was it was it was in Fars, the Farsi dating system, and essentially the the visas had been issued in the future. Uh, the Iranian calendar starts on the twenty first of March, so if you say that a Visa was issued um, uh, in the say tenth month. That would be say for October for us, but it would be January for them. And we're in January. <coughs> this is not going to work. Um, so this was before time travel was invented. That's right. <laughs> so I said, Houston, we got a problem. Well, I actually, I think I said something. If, if you believe the book that came out by Pelche shortly after, I said some very scatological things. And I can't remember if I did, but I may well have. And, but anyway, I was not amused. Um, but we, and we went to Ottawa, and they said, don't worry about it, Tony will come and fix it. Actually, we didn't know him as Tony. He was uh, Kevin uh, something or other. But... Uh, and he did. Fortunately, there was a spare set, and when he came, we were able to get a better visa date. Um, so that was the one glitch. And 
There was no car chase. When they went through the airport, they were hung over because we'd had a really, really great briefing session <laughs> the night before. And nobody was any psychic pain. We were certainly in physical pain. Uh, that expl explains the one glimpse of the morning of the departure. Oh, uh, oh yes, uh, Tony Mendez slept in. <laughs> My New Zealand colleague, um, who was picking him up, was suddenly found he wasn't ready, and he had to sort of hoist him out of his bed and <laughs> take him to the airport. Uh, Tony actually admits it in his book. So, it's, um, but uh, no, they there was no problems. So, 6 a.m., they're over there on a flight to Zurich. Uh, meanwhile, you've been winding down the Canadian staff from a maximum of about 18, I think, to where there's four of you left on the ground. There's you, there's Ambassador Taylor, there's two others, and you've got things to do before you can get out of there in the afternoon, among which is make it look like it's business as usual with the Canadian Embassy. Well, what we've done is um, we, the ambassador told the Iranian foreign ministry that he'd been called back to Ottawa for, Ottawa for consultations and that because he is out of town uh, and there was nothing else for the rest of us to do, we were all going on holiday for a week till he got back. So we said the Canadian embassy is going to be closed down for a week. Um, in the meantime, we're busily calling all the Canadian nationals that are left in Tehran. Fortunately, not many uh, left and said, um, Canadian Embassy is going to be absent for a while, and we think it might be wise if you uh, made this a good time, uh, took this as an opportunity to part Iran. Um, so we, we managed to, that was the first thing we had to do was make sure all the Canadians we could find were contacted. I think most of them got the message and got out. Um, we also had to make sure, now we, we pretty well cleared the embassy of anything that was possibly classified from the time of the hostage taking on. We systematically destroyed every classified document in the embassy. We destroyed, as they were generated or received, they were destroyed. So we essentially had, we were running on memory when it came to our um, uh, information, uh, you know, data retrieval. Um, but there was, uh, but there was still the cipher equipment that had to be uh, destroyed. And um, our good sergeant uh, Claude Gautier bought a special ten-pound sledgehammer, um, wrapped our cipher machine in uh, in a red diplomatic bag, took it into the vault and pounded away in the building, which is not very uh, sturdy building, shook from end to end. But there was no cipher machine left. And so that done, uh, we were about to go out the door when the telephone rang. It was the Iranian foreign ministry. And I thought, uh-oh. <laughs> and they said, um, we're having little trouble flying planes into the States. I was one, we were wondering, could we negotiate an air agreement with Canada? And I said, well, a complicated issue, but I'd be pleased to discuss it, but can't do it tomorrow. i um, going to be out of town for a week, but can we talk next week? Okay. So we sort of set up a meeting for the following week. Then we went to lunch, uh, hosted by uh, the Danish ambassador, who was a collector of fine wines. Uh, first time and only time in my life I've had Chateau Lafitte Rothschild. Mm, yeah. Um, couldn't quite appreciate it, but it was wonderful. And then we all went trooping off to the airport. Um, uh, there was uh, the Danes and the New Zealanders who are co-conspirators. And um, they saw us through, through all the security and... We boarded a Lufthansa, I'm uh, sorry, SAS flight, and uh, a few hours later we were, we left at four o'clock, and a few hours later we we're in Copenhagen. And then the news broke at the Lester Pearson cafeteria, and having no champagne to toast them in, we toasted them in bad warm coffee, and uh, 
and the celebration started. Um, my mind was officially blown for the second time this evening because my whole diplomatic and pre-diplomatic experience was in the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact, and I was used to the concept that even the cockroaches were bugged, that you couldn't do anything that they didn't know you were going to do before you did it. And I'm just sitting here going, they let you get away with this? I mean, were you under no surveillance at all? I'm not sure if we were under no surveillance at all. Uh, from what I've heard, there were people in the foreign ministry that knew we had the Americans because the three senior American diplomats who were holed up in their conference room had taken them into their confidence. Uh, had, in the conference room, had told them, yes, they did. Yes, I didn't know that, and I'm glad I didn't know that. Um, there was also, I came downstairs one morning, uh, the, the house guests had been living with our immigration officer, John Sheardown, but 10 days before the evacuation, he and his wife had been pulled out as part of our drawdown, and also partly because CBC had photographed long lines of Iranian visa seekers outside the Canadian embassy, and people saying, what are you giving visas to Iranians for? Close the visa and section right away. So they were pulled out. And I moved in as babysitter and I came downstairs one evening and there was uh, one of our American guests on the phone to his wife in Athens. And I said, Bob, what are you doing? Mm. He said, oh, I was told it's all right. And I said, it's not all right. So after that, every time I heard a car stop outside the house, my heart would stop and, um, but anyway, I think what happened is the Iranians had had a secret police. Uh, they were very savage secret police. We all have heard, I hope, of Savak. Uh, they were so bad that some of them were known to take their torture cases home, to work on at home. Um, <laughs> But they weren't very good. There, there, used to, there was a saying in Iran that in the days of the old Shah, that's Reza Shah who founded the dynasty, nobody dared lie to the Shah. In the days of the young Shah, this is Reza Pahlavi, nobody dared tell the truth. And frankly, I don't think Savak ever did a good job. Then comes the revolution. All the senior members of Savak are taken out and shot. Uh, it takes a little while to rebuild morale and esprit de corps in a... Um, in an intelligence organization which has just been eviscerated. So I think they just hadn't got their act together. I understand now they are very good indeed. But in those days, fortunately, they were going through a bit of management, reorganization, you know, uh, getting a new mission statement, the usual sort of thing. So fortunately for us, that was not a problem. But we weren't sure, we didn't know. and. Um, uh, thank God for us it was. Ladies and gentlemen, that brings the formal interrogation to a close. Um, we've yapped enough between the two of us. What I'd like to do now is ask Ed Raymond, who has good eyes, which I could say about neither of us, <laughs> to come up here and chose, choose the slayers from among you. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you, you've heard the story now, and I'm sure all of you have gotten questions. Who would like to be the first one to start off with questions? Yes, sir. Uh, being a, an ultra studier, were you ever worried? Because there's a fair amount of correspondence back and forth to Ottawa and with the Americans to Washington, presumably, that they were able to break in, or was it you, again, as you were just saying, it was too new for them to be able to concentrate on breaking into what you were saying back and forth and therefore giving the game away. Uh, everything we sent back and forth to Ottawa, we did not use the phone needless to say. For one thing, the phone didn't work very well. Uh, tried, uh, that scene in the movie where they're phoning Hollywood, forget it. To try to get an outside long distance line from Tehran <laughs> to North America, it takes about a week. Uh, anyway, we did everything by cipher. We have, we had, I'm sure we still do, very, very good cipher equipment, uh, very, very strong codes. I don't think it was 
it's all likely that the Iranians could have broken that. Now, whether some of the people to the north of Iran had that capability, their relations weren't terribly good at that time either, and of course they were all busy taking over Afghanistan. So, I don't think, that was not one of our problems. The problem was more that somebody might pick up something in Tehran and, and blow our cover. Yes, do we have another question over here? Yeah. I'm just curious about uh, daily life uh, before the revolution, after the revolution, and was safety an issue, not just because of the Americans, but just for you or the diplomatic corps after the revolution, and, and how was your daily life at that time? Uh, safety, I would say, was more an issue before the revolution and in the immediate aftermath of the revolution because there were, you know, growing degree of unrest. And then after the revolution, be, before the revolution, of course, there was the army and police who were meant to be keeping order in the streets, which, well, clearly they ultimately failed. After the revolution, you know, one, one, one morning, you know, one night you go to sleep, you hear the usual gunfire, and you know it's the army. Ah, uh, fine. The next day, it, the guns are in everybody's hands, and everyone's trying out their new G3 and their new MG42, and God forbid some of them even got RPG-7s and don't always realize you shouldn't fire it in an enclosed space. So everyone was trying out their new toys, and that, well, does make one pensive. Uh, personally, you know, I never really felt terribly threatened. I mean, there were times when you weren't quite sure what might happen. Uh, and there were certainly places where you took care to avoid. Uh, but never really found any particular animosity or a, sort of a direct threat towards me. It's more you might get caught up in something that uh, could be bad for your health. Uh, after the revolution, you had, well, bef before the revolution there were checkpoints. After the che revolution there were checkpoints. They were run by, obviously, different sets of people. Um, you just treated them with care and respect. You do not like... I don't know if anyone ever saw that movie which came out the same route that time called A Year of Living Dangerously where he runs a roadblock. You don't run roadblocks. You come to a stop. You uh, wave as much diplomatic ID. Uh, here's my diplomat. CSC, CSC. Uh, and and uh, so I've explained very carefully that we're diplomats, you're not supposed to shoot diplomats, you're not supposed to search them. Um, it generally worked. Occasionally, occasionally you had to sort of wait while they called sort of the revolutionary committee and, and but somebody would eventually let, tell them to let you go up. So, no, uh, now, I, I don't really know much about life in Tehran before the revolution, I'm told it was great. A friend of mine was posted there. He had the time of his life. And that's really why I wanted to go there. Uh, but, you know, you arrive there, and a week later, it's 9 o'clock curfew. <laughs> no social life. You sit in your apartment. The lights go out. The machine gun fires start in the street. And <laughs> you sort of write letters home by candlelight saying... Mm. <laughs> the, I think the most exciting time was... Uh, week after the revolution, uh, there was a, an attempt actually on the American Revolu uh, embassy on February 14th by, by uh, some revolutionary group or other, and they actually took it over for a while, but were told to let it go. But at the same time, that night, they attacked the TV station, which was down the hill from where I lived, and a great light show, tracer fire all over the place. I spent that night in the bathtub, and it was the only room which had no... Uh, no, no, um, no windows, and hopefully I get a little protection from the bathtub. But that was about the most dangerous night I had. Okay, we have a question from Colonel Moody's table. Yeah. Oh, I, was, I was just wondering how much CIA involvement there really was in all of this. Uh, in terms of physical presence, uh, there were two guys there the last two days. In terms of all the background stuff. Uh, you should read Tony Mendez's book, Argo, which is not at all like the film. It is absolutely incredible the meticulous detail they go into 
doing their, their, their stuff in the documentation and building the cover stories, in making sure everything matches. It's absolutely breathtaking. And then, of course, the, the really key thing was that Tony Mendez is a great salesman. And he sold those cover stories. It, we all wanted to play the part. We were so, it was, it was great. It was, yeah, we were part of that Hollywood thing. It was, uh, it was, it was, it was just an impeccable piece of showmanship. Now, there was another little thing, and you, I, I recommend to everyone, there's a book came out two years ago, Our Man in Tehran, uh, by Robert Wright. He's a professor at Oshawa. Very meticulous research. It is, I would say, the definitive book on the Tehran crisis. And he tells about how Ken Taylor and um, our head of our military police, Jim Edward, who at last died about a year ago, were, were involved in helping the CIA re-establish their, their network in Iran and start laying some of the groundwork for the rescue operation Eagle Claw. And um, I wasn't part of that. I knew something was going on, uh, but I didn't want to ask questions. What you don't know, they can't torture out of you. <laughs> and you know, we really believed in those days a need to know. There were actually a few staffers in our embassy who knew nothing about our house guests. Really? Uh, really. There were, you know. How many staff at that point? Uh, I guess about 15, but as, as you were yeah. saying, we were drawing them down. But yeah. there were a few who we didn't think really needed to be bothered with this. Yes. Question yeah. What about the uh, locally hired staff, the cook or the stewardess, whatever? In the term, in uh, the the four of them were at the house of the Sheerdats, and they had a maid. She's a Filipina. She was basically loyal to them. She left with them. Uh, she got her Canadian visa. She was not a problem. I'm the. I'm not quite, there were three staff at the, at the ambassador's residence who had two of the guests. Um, I, I don't know the details, but he certainly did ensure that they asked no questions. Uh, I, th I think you got to hand it to Ken Taylor. He's a very good, he's very charismatic, he's a great team leader, he builds trust, he builds confidence. Um, I think you can make sure that he, 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 that he had their confidence. Any other questions? Yes, go in the back. There's yeah. a lady in the back. Yeah. How did you hide the extra quantities of food that would be required when your staff was, and, and your energy was increasing in number? Do you know how you did that? Uh, well, fortunately, for one thing, um, we had large stocks of stuff because we, a lot of people had made large orders of, uh, before the revolution, uh, had ordered large quantities of, of wine and spirits and candles <laughs> and all that sort of stuff. And then, then, then they, were all, they all left and we, we were sitting on a huge stockpile which was gradually running out with little chance of, of, of replenishment, but uh, it was certainly enough to keep our American guests happy. And other than that, you just go shopping around all over town so you don't seem to be you know, doing too much of it. And then it's the problem of getting rid of the empties, which you also have to distribute around all over town. But that was not so much my problem most of the time. That was John Shudas problem because he was the principal uh, keeper of the house guests. You're not saying he kept them sedated. <laughs> uh, they were in no pain. Yes, there was another question from the same table. Uh, the, uh, the American embassy was taken over. Yeah. What happened to the Canadian embassy when all of you left? Did they take over the problem? No, they didn't. It's, it's kind of interesting, but... Um, it was locked up, we left it, we locked it up, we put all the stuff in, you know, that was of any value in our vault, and 
we left. And it took until 1988 that we were allowed to reopen it. And if you want to know about that, my dear wife Susan was desk officer for part of that period, and she can tell you about uh, what that, you know, those negotiations. But when our people came back, uh, the embassy was basically untouched. I think there'd been some rifling around the lower stories, but they hadn't got into the vault. And uh, a lot of stuff was just sit apparently sitting as we'd left it. Including hmm. bits of cipher machine? Or... Ooh, well, yes. <laughs> uh, are you still in contact with some of the hostages? Uh, house guests. House guests. <laughs> we were not holding them hostage. So <laughs> maybe we could have got some deal on fisheries or something. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I am, uh, especially with Mark Lajek and his wife Cora. And we've had uh, three or four reunions every five years we get together. Uh, we don't do it in January. Uh, we, do, we usually do it in the summer. And I've hosted a couple, and the ambas uh, Ken Taylor's sec then secretary, Laverna Dollymore, who passed away a couple of years ago, she hosted one. And... Um, uh, we've had Tony Mendes down and uh, Ken Taylor's come and we've all and some of the people who were the people who were involved in Ottawa and we've had Flora. Hmm? Flora came. Oh Flora came McDonald came to one, yes. So yes, we do have regular contact. Excellent. The, la the last question. Do you have a last anybody the last question? Yes. Where are we now then? With Where? our embassy and Iran and uh, we, closed, uh, we closed. We closed diplomatic relations last year. Uh, essentially, it's been getting more and more poisonous. The state of the relationship. Uh, I'm trying to remember the. There was oh, ever since you know Zara, the that poor journalist lady Zara, uh, yeah, was was beaten to death. The things have been getting bad. And then we enacted some new legislation about being able to sue countries that perpetrate terrorism. And Iran was on the schedule of those countries. And just before that list was published, the, the embassy was quietly shut down. Literally, it was an exfiltration almost as, uh, as, as carefully planned as ours. They, they slipped out in the dead of night. Uh, and 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 before before any repercussions could come, and so we have no diplomatic relations with Iran. Uh, there, embassy was told to close. They couldn't find anyone. Ottawa couldn't find anyone to deliver the note to. They weren't answering the phone, so they essentially just poked it through the through the door, the mailbox, and said, yeah, "Goodbye, go." <laughs> and that was that. We do not have relations. <laughs> This concludes our webcast series for the spring 2013 RCMI season. On behalf of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse wishing you a wonderful and relaxing summer and looking forward to seeing everyone again in the fall.